we'll be having, we'll be really looking at uh, civil society partnership with tech companies. And to have this discussion, I'm really glad that we have some of the friends who have been working in this kind of space. And I'll quickly introduce them. On my left, right here, I'm joined with uh, Kiara O'Connor, who is a writer, speaker, and activist, and who serves as the chief marketing officer for Breva Angels, and, uh, which is the nation's largest, actually, nonprofit working to bring liberals and conservatives to bridge their partisan divide. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank uh, you. Karen for, ha for, for coming here. Now, I also have Devika on the left far corner. Uh, she is a policy consultant, researcher, based in New Delhi, India, and has worked for quite some time across journalism and public policy in India and the U.S. for actually about a decade and a, a, decade and a half, and uh, has last drove Meta's programs on hate speech, extremism, and misinformation in India. Thank you so much, Devika. And on my right, I have Jeanne. Jeanne is uh, Meta's lead uh, prog uh, program manager for Trusted Partner Program, which builds partnerships with civil society organizations to strengthen their social media monitoring capacity and to inform Meta's content policies and enforcement process processes and products. So it's really all about how Meta works with civil society organizations to strengthen its own internal policies and to strengthen the capacities to moderate content online. Now, I want to start this conversation by turning to Jeanne and asking if you could kindly share with us a little bit of what is this Meta's approach to partnership with civil society organizations and how uh, has this partnership sought to work to advance social cohesion in online platforms? Thank you so much, Christian. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to listen to all of you over the last two days. Um, I was honored to be interviewed by Lisa and other colleagues for the research that kind of underpinned this conference, and it's, it's nice to come full circle and be here with you to listen to all of the great um, insights and research that's taking place. So a little bit more about myself I think is useful to frame the approach that I've taken to my own work at Meta and also to my um, remarks today. So before joining Meta, I spent 15 years in the human rights field as a human rights grant maker, most recently working on international justice, which for those of you who didn't follow was a very, is a very contentious topic and was a very contentious one when I was working on it, specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, when I joined Meta, I was responsible for developing our human rights programs around digital security, once again in sub-Saharan Africa, and then in, two years ago I took over Meta's Global Trusted Partner Program. So if I'm going to talk about Meta's approach to partnership with civil society, I can really speak the most deeply about my own work. But of course, Meta is a huge company, and there are lots of teams that partner with civil society. I would say that the first element of this partnership is really around our human rights responsibility, right, as a business, understanding the impact of our platforms around the world and leveraging and trying to partner with civil society to benefit from the expertise of folks like those who are in the room, who are experts in their field, who understand how content on social media may be impacting communities around the world, whether that's in the peace building community or around women's rights or refugee rights. There's a lot of different ways that this can happen. And so my own program works on this issue, and, and one of the taglines that we use to describe it is that our trusted partners are critical partners, right? And so this is intentionally a play on words because our partners are critical because they help us understand harmful content, but they're also critical because they hold us accountable. So when our partners tell us that our platforms are having a potentially negative impact, it's really the responsibility of my team and the other teams that we work with at the company to try to figure out what can be done in terms of our own responsibility on the platforms. My program works with partners across 112 countries. We have over 400 partnerships already established. And really, the program has three goals. The first is to enforce our community standards through contextual expertise. Oh, closer, sorry. Um, the second one is to really make sure that we're working with groups that can represent the experience of marginalized communities. So when we identify partners for my program, it's not just any organization that's from a particular region of the world, but is it an organization that works with communities that are 
disproportionately impacted by content, that have the expertise to tell us about the trends that they're observing on our platforms, and importantly, do they represent the voices and experiences of folks who otherwise would not have access and influence. Um, and then finally, we do work with these partners to influence policies. And so um, I actually sit within the content policy team at Meta, and so part of my remit is to ensure that the policies that govern what is allowed on the platform are fit for purpose. And we do that by soliciting external expertise to inform those policies. And our trusted partners become a first point of call for that kind of external engagement when we're revising policies or updating them to make sure that folks who are already quite knowledgeable about how our policies work, perhaps some of the gaps um, in their application, can also inform how we are constantly trying to strengthen and improve them. Another element of our work with partners with civil society across Meta is in co-design, right? So once we've understood the problems, how do we develop solutions for them? And I think this is a theme that has come up a lot um, in today's discussions and in, in yesterday's overview, which is how do tech companies work in partnership with civil society to develop solutions that are mutually beneficial, right? That are informed by lived experience and expertise. So my own program does this around our content policies, but of course we have the product teams who do this to develop products. We also have teams that focus on social impact that work with civil society to understand what's the best way we can support groups that are using our platforms in positive ways to amplify their work, et cetera. Um, and then finally, I would say that our partnerships try to make an ecosystem level investment in infrastructure and in um, kind of the capacity of civil society organizations to both be effective in um, their advocacy and engagement with tech, meaning that when we educate civil society about our content policies and about content moderation, it kind of empowers them to be more informed in their advocacy when they're giving us feedback on what we're doing right or wrong. And also it contributes to what is a broader ecosystem of actors that kind of holds internet governance at a higher level, right? And so my own program has a small grants element where we provide funding to, to our partners, but more broadly, um, Meta also supports the humanitarian sector and a lot of um, advocacy organizations that use our pl platforms to promote their, their advocacy messages. And once again, this is a contribution to a broader effort that is beyond um, Meta's own remit. So that, in summary, is what I can say about our approach to partnership with civil society. Thank you very much, Jean, for, for that presentation and for that overview of the Trusted Partnership Program. Now I want to move to uh, Devika on the far end. Um, Devika, you have worked previously with Meta. And I'm just curious to hear from your experience as someone who has worked with Meta and who's now, you know, working as a pro, uh, as a uh, policy consultant, what has been your understanding or what are some of the regional experiences of CSOs and tech companies' partnership in addressing societal violence that you, you can share from your experience? Thanks, Christian. So as you mentioned, uh, you know, I worked at Meta in the public policy team for South Asia between 2018 and 20. And so... Here, try using this one. Okay. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. So I was just mentioning that I worked with Meta between 2018 and 20 in the public policy team uh, for South Asia. So that team covered uh, not just India, but also Bangladesh um, and uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Afghanistan and Nepal, m mostly in a coverage model, but sort of hands-on uh, for India, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. And uh, the issues that I focused on were hate speech, misinfo, and countering violent extremism. And as Jean mentioned, uh, you know, uh, on-ground teams would often partner with civil society organizations to source sort of local input, not just on content policy, but also on content escalations, to capture early warning signals for harmful content, to serve as listening posts, provide policy feedback, so on and so forth. Um, one of the uh, sort of um, main points of uh, uh, and, and also, you know, helpfully, we were, um, uh, you know, one of the speakers earlier today sh uh, set the context for, say, Sri Lanka, where in, in, in Sri Lanka and like the rest of South Asia, especially <coughs> in India, we are faced with semi-authoritarian, majoritarian, far-reaching governments. 
um, where civic space is somewhat diminished and uh, you know many democratic institutions are either appropriated or uh, co-opted or disempowered. So it's difficult to find space to have dialogue with civil society safely. But it's further complicated, actually, uh, by the fact that the teams that are brokering this dialogue with civil society on ground are actually public policy teams. So, uh, you know, the primary mandates of these teams are to solve for regulatory risk. You know, these are the teams that are going to service uh, content takedown requests from the government, data requests from the government, uh, are going to be uh, the ones making, you know, socializing the company's position when they want to fend off uh, overreaching regulation on, um, you know, content regulation, but also on privacy and data protection. And so when you try to, um, you know, when you position this, this team or these, per these personnel uh, to front face with civil society, there is an in inherent sort of tension and conflict there. And that plays out in, in a couple of ways. So the first, you know, um, uh, way in which it plays out is that it creates this perverse incentive for uh, uh, selection bias. Uh, and uh, gatekeeping of partners, right? And so uh, when you do have, um, you know, uh, governments and civil society locking heads on issues of freedom of expression and speech, where is the incentive for a company to partner with uh, civil society organizations or groups that are going to be politically exposed? You know, many activists, journalists, whistleblowers uh, are going to prove to be very risky stakeholders for a company to defend um, uh, engaging with when it comes to their in interactions with their primary stakeholder, which is government. And so that uh, premise itself is a little bit flawed. Uh, the second way in which this plays out is that it also sort of is left to the discretion of local teams to then frame content uh, challenges and the programmatic responses to them, right, in ways that serve these overarching policy and regulatory goals. Uh, so for example, a program uh, in India on countering violent extremism um, can quite conveniently be framed as countering um, Islamic radicalization in Kashmir and other parts of India to solve for national security threat uh, and, counter uh, and terrorism threat because that builds common ground with government while underplaying and you know from what we know now from um, public disclosures um, proactively sort of um, uh, uh, you know, proactively blocking the threat uh, or, or the expression of the threat from Hindu nationalism or, you know, or, or uh, tackling uh, content, anti-Muslim and anti-minority content from supporters of the Hindu right wing. And some of, those are some of the ways in which just this sort of st internal structuring of public policy being the primary negotiator of this relationship uh, poses a challenge to this relationship. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is, you know, even if we did assume that there are ways around this, if global teams are able to come in and build more trust with civil society, um, if there is, if there are spaces created for this dialogue to 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 happen safely, the sort of the goal, as as Jean uh, described, right, in the best case scenario, we are leveraging the full potential of these partnerships, is to really kind of capture that intelligence, get local context in contexts like India where there are. There's a multiplicity of languages where uh, content moderation systems are not evolved in, in non-English and, you know, even, even in primary languages like Hindi, Bengali, Assamese. Uh, trusted partners, other civil society partners really are critical resources, right? And so we should be seeing this, this feedback loop of trusted, you know, civil society input informing content escalations, the company then being able to enforce not just on a particular escalation, but being able to enforce at scale based on that signal, that then informing policy feed, po policy development and policy revision, and finally that informing product where the company then uses the signal to dig in, gather more data and um, train its algorithms finally. Um, we don't actually see this. Uh, actualized, right? And I'll share, you know, a couple of examples, uh, if you'll allow me the time, to just demonstrate how this kind of escalation, uh, you know, does play out. So. Um, in 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 um, uh, you know at the, at, as in, at the onset of the pandemic, we did see uh, in India and also other parts of the world uh, COVID misinformation being weaponized 
to advance anti-minority hatred, right? So in hashtag Corona Jihad was, um, you know, being used to, to post and share content uh, uh, that showed, you know, out of context images of Muslims contaminating food or medicines or flouting uh, COVID restrictions uh, to, to impute that there was a sort of a, a concerted effort by a certain community to cause harm to, to uh, the rest of uh, the population. And when this was escalated uh, by a partner, um, it was found actually by internal teams that the hashtag Corona Jihad doesn't actually violate the letter of the policy, the hate speech policy. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't think I have time to go into the minutiae of the policy, but you know, that outcome is counterintuitive, right? And so um, it's, it can be very frustrating for the partner escalating this in very good faith uh, to have that kind of response for the, from the company. And so even after sort of repeated, uh, repeatedly bringing evidence to the company when they see that it's really not um, uh, you know, having the impact that that is, is required in that um, critical moment, uh, you know, this is a partner that is actually situated outside of India, is able to then rally, um, uh, you know, international press, and only when there is a press query does uh, the company decide that, well, actually, there might be other policies under which this can be actioned, and then they decide to do it. And so that kind of, you know, not just demonstrates a missed opportunity, but also a lack of accountability that we really need to think about uh, when we think about these partnerships going forward. I think I'm out of time, so I'll hand Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Devika, for giving that kind of very nuanced and very contextualized understanding of how this partnership works out. I want to now move to Kieran a little bit to kind of also have a little bit of your own reading of mm -hmm. how does uh, the role of tech vis-a-vis -vis political polarization work in the context of the U.S.? Sure. Thank you, Christian. And also just want to express a note of gratitude to Lisa, who has put in an enormous amount of work to make this happen. Um, and I, I think it's safe to say without whom none of us would be here. So can you guys hear me okay? Um, so I guess I'll start by just talking a little bit about the story of Braver Angels. We're a nonprofit that tries to bring conservatives and progressives together in the current political environment, sort of the lessons we've learned about what works and what doesn't, and how that might be useful for the tech community and tech and organizations like Braver Angels to work together in the future. So Braver Angels got started in the wake of the 2016 election, and we wanted to bring together a group of people who'd voted for Trump and a group of people who voted for Clinton together to see could that be constructive. So we started to organize a workshop and then we said, we probably need to figure out a good way to do this. So we reached out to a professor who specializes in family therapy and couples counseling. He specializes in working with couples who are on the brink of divorce. And he designed our initial red blue workshop, which draws on the principles of couples therapy and communication, trust building, getting out of that high conflict that people have been talking about and applied it to a political context. And so developed a series of exercises that would help the two sides better understand each other's perspectives, clarify what the disagreements actually are, illuminate some common values, and start to build trust and relationships that over time actually allow you to explore common ground in good faith. So we did that first workshop, and it turned out that the people who came actually kind of liked each other. And that's not to say that they agreed. They didn't agree. But they wanted to keep talking. They wanted to move forward. And so out of that grew the Braver Angels movement. It's very decentralized. We have alliances all over the country. We've expanded our offerings to include debates on college campuses. We've started producing our own media to sort of model what this kind of constructive cross-partisan discourse could look like in the media space and the public conversation. And we've also started to take it to institutions, academia, politics. How can we start to influence institutions so institutions can influence individuals, individuals can influence institutions. And we've seen through data that our workshops do have meaningful reductions in people's levels of affective polarization, their attitudes toward the other side. So, what in our structure 
has helped us succeed where other groups have failed. The first expectation that we require people to abandon when they come into our work is that they're going to change the other person's mind. It's simple, but it's important to remind yourself when you go into a conversation with someone you disagree with politically, don't try to change their mind off the bat. You're here to express your perspective and then hear theirs and, and start with understanding. We also encourage people to speak from lived experiences. So people are so used to just regurgitating their own tribal orthodoxy or regurgitating the talking points that they saw on Fox or MSNBC and forget to actually talk about why they really believe what they believe. And when people do that, it humanizes them. And people who disagree with them on the issue can start to see themselves a little bit in the other person. So even if they don't disagree, even if they don't agree with the person, they can understand why they have that position. So those are two lessons we've learned. The third lesson is that you really do need to be bipartisan to make this work. I think a lot of organizations that have tried to build bridges tend to skew progressive. And then what you have is progressives talking to progressives and a lot of conservatives uh, are concerned or alienated because they say, well, I don't particularly care to become enlightened <laughs> by, by your philosophy. And so how could what we've done be useful to tech companies? We have explored some partnerships with tech companies to see could we bring what works for us on land face to face where you have that natural intimacy, transition that to Zoom, which is kind of the next step, which we did during the pandemic. And we saw that by having the same rules and the same buy-in, we were able to maintain the constructive conversations to a digital platform, which is more anonymized, where there's less control. And so the first partnership we did was with an organization called Wisdo, and it's a mental health app. So it creates communities for people to come together around shared struggles. So anxiety, depression, um, chronic pain, eating disorders. And what we worked on them was how do we maintain trust and how do we enable sort of like self-regulation and self-moderation? Because you, you can't have sort of a Braver Angels moderator be in every chat room or every group. And so what we came, came up with was sort of like giving people different privileges based on their behavior. And so when you're an initial user, you might have a certain level of basic privileges. When you start to demonstrate that you're a good actor, we then sort of gave people the moniker guide. And guides had more power. And this was accepted by the community. And then once you were a guide, you could become a helper. And then once you were a helper, there was like the highest level. Um, and that, that seemed to work, but that was very small scale. And so I was encouraged by that initial partnership. And um, maybe later I can say a little bit more about how that could be relevant for uh, big tech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kieran, for that as well. And I uh, look forward to actually continuing that point. But I want to return back to Jeanne. And just looking at the work that uh, you're leading with Meta, um, Trusted Partnership Program, could you maybe share a little bit of some of the challenges, the main challenges that you are seeing in terms of the partnership model that uh, is uh, being implemented with CSOs? And what approaches does Meta have to address these challenges? Sure. Is it OK? Thank you. So yeah, I think that I'm um, very happy to answer that question. And I think that Devika already started me <laughs> on the potential challenges of the partnership model. Um, I like to take things back to the basics. And for those who ever did follow the international justice you know, debates, we often talk about whether states are able and willing right, to participate in accountability processes. And I take the same you know, perspective on engagement and partnership. Are both partners? able and willing to constructively engage in collaboration. Um, in terms of a, you know, willingness, this is the trust deficit that I think we've been talking about since yesterday. Clearly, there's a trust deficit between civil society and big tech. Um, in many cases, it's legitimate. Uh, but I also think that we have to disaggregate. You know, there's a huge trust deficit in the US. There's a huge trust deficit in India, from what I've understood. But there's other parts of the world where you know, our platforms are the only source of alternate information. Our platforms are where people get go to get news because 
all media is state controlled. And so I think, you know, build, rebuilding that trust is a big part of making partnerships effective. Um, and it's a two-way street. Um, on my side, working at Meta, I try to build that trust by being transparent, by sharing information about what's possible and what's not possible. Being held accountable for what I can do internally to advocate for the perspective of my partners when they do kind of surface, let's say, trends or specific pieces of content that need to be evaluated in context. And I think that through those types of interactions, we can rebuild trust, which is really the foundation of partnership. Um, another issue around willingness is, is really about whether there's like the frameworks put in place for these things to actually happen, for the partnerships to, to function, and for both civil society and tech to, to be able to benefit from them. Um, the second part of that is, of course, ability. And here, I think we talked about it since yesterday um, and earlier with our, our the professor who presented about the context in Sri Lanka. I think in many parts of the world where we need these partnerships the most, especially for my program where we're trying to understand the impact of harmful content on local communities, is also the places where it's the hardest to build these partnerships because civil society is constrained, because of the political context, because resources are very limited for the civil society to begin with, because NGO laws restrict NGO's ability to even receive funding, either from the tech sector or from the philanthropic sector. And in those environments, there's a lot of external conditions that make partnership challenging, but that's also where we need those partnerships. Um, similarly, I'd say on the tech sector, there's, there's constraints that make those partnerships difficult. Um, it's about prioritization, right? Making the case for these partnerships to be invested in and resourced, and it's, and it's work that kind of is mutually reinforcing. The more we can build the case with civil society that these partnerships are effective, uh, desired, mutually beneficial, the, the, ease, the better position we are internally within tech to make those partnerships a big part of the way we work. Um, I would say that, you know, so those are some of the challenges. As, as Devika pointed out, there are misses, but I think that there's also a lot of success stories that unfortunately don't get the same media coverage as all of the mistakes. Um, in my program, I, I don't want to speak about concrete examples because in many ways we protect the identity of our partners by not disclosing their identities externally because, like I said, they operate in these environments where it could put them at risk. But oftentimes our partners can highlight trends that it takes someone in country with local expertise to surface. It wouldn't, you know, maybe if we work with Mercy Corps or with Search, or we do work with Search for Common Ground, um, we would be able to get these insights on a more regular basis. But sometimes it's even more granular than that. And it really takes somebody embedded in the community to tell us when something is emerging. And then that allows us with that information to, to take an informed action. I would say that in terms of lessons learned about how to make these partnerships effective and address these challenges, it's really about patience and resilience, right? So this is not something that can happen overnight. Um, I think building trust, rebuilding trust when there has been a loss of trust is through repeated engagement, right? You don't only have dialogue when things are going well, you also have dialogue when things are going badly. And I think that having an interlocutor that you have confidence in their commitment to address the concerns raised goes a long way. Um, I think another element that's really important is resourcing, right? So. My program does provide um, small grants. This is the way that we've found that we can provide unrestricted operational support. So it's not tied to any deliverable, but it's really about enabling the groups that do this work to continue to exist, especially in a global context where civil society is being repressed. Um, I think that that's kind of fundamental to enable these partnerships and to overcome these challenges. Um, and then finally, I would say it's meetings like this one, right? The whole, my purpose in being here is to learn from all of you and to also explore what else we could be doing um, in collaboration to address the very legitimate concerns that we all have about polarization um, and the role of social media. I think that, I'll just reinforce it, one of the best solutions is to shine light on the success stories, right? Where, is, where do we see social media contributing to social cohesion? How can we learn from that? And how can we amplify that? Um, so yeah, I can stop there, but thank you very much.
uh, again, Jean, for that sharing. And I think one of the points that you shared, which I think is very relevant for this conversation, is that we tend often to focus on the negatives rather than look also at the positives. And I think it really takes a mental shift. It takes courage. It takes, you know, understanding the other side of the spectrum. And this brings me back again to Devika, and maybe from your experience as well. I wonder if you could share a little bit more about what are some of the other enabling conditions that we, we must put in place to, to restore this kind of relationship with tech companies. Right. In fact, I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know, just to complete the example that I was uh, referring to earlier, uh, you know, despite sort of the uh, ways in which the company finally responded to that content, that along with similar escalations, not just Corona Jihad, but Love Jihad, and also, you know, China virus. And the blocker there on the policy was that uh, in the spirit, the hate speech policy, uh, as it stood at the time at Meta, uh, actually allowed for attacks on concepts and ideas, uh, and would disallow for um, similar attacks on uh, people or communities subscribing to those concepts and ideas. So Jihad because it is an idea and a concept is fair game for criticism and attack. Um, like I said, that that you know policy frequently throws counterintuitive outcomes where it is very clear that you can only associate one community with that term jihad, and especially on the back of communal riots or. Uh, you know, other instances of communal tension, uh, it really becomes uh, harmful content. Um, what, because of, you know, this kind of escalation, uh, by the end of that year, actually, Meta was looking at revising that distinction uh, between, uh, you know, concepts, uh, ideas, and, and people. And so that, that ultimately, I think, is a win for that kind of engagement, even though, you know, it's not, it wasn't the ideal way for to, to actualize that relationship of trust. Um, in other cases, you know, again, there have been escalations that could really have informed uh, product, could have informed, uh, you know, like I said, when we were seeing hate speech in Assamese, we had uh, partners escalate uh, hundreds of pieces of content, um, you know, uh, of anti-Muslim hate uh, uh, against Bengali Muslims, and Facebook didn't at the time have any hate speech or, uh, you know, classifiers or classifiers for uh, 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 incitement to violence at the time. Uh, and this, these signals, you know, really should have been leveraged. And again, what we saw was this um, very defensive strategy until, you know, the press was involved. And, uh, and on both sides, you know, that's, that diminishes trust, really trust on both sides, because the company does not want to be repeatedly put through that kind of public scrutiny. It doesn't want to engage deeply with partners who are, uh, you know, going to press, but partners at the same time are feeling like that is the only uh, recourse uh, that they have. Um, Coming to enabling conditions, like I said, you know, first to really decouple sort of the uh, partnerships uh, work from policy work. I think that itself will go a long way because, uh, you know, then social cohesion can be the central goal of that partnership and that programming rather than it being a positive externality. Um, the other thing I think is also to, um, especially in contexts like India where we don't have, you know, the, the peace building community uh, already was niche and small and has really fallen by the wayside. Civil society itself is feeling really pushed against the corner. This is a very retaliatory regime. International NGOs, UN agencies ha are not op able to operate in India. They are able to do so in, in uh, Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka. Um, and so there is really kind of, um, you know, there's merit in saying that, you know, these partnerships can lead to ecosystem development where there are no IFCN accredited fact checkers, you know, Meta does get in and build capacity and help them. Uh, get that accreditation so they can partner with the company on third party fact checking. But that also runs the risk of uh, ecosystem capture. Uh, and so, you know, the enabling environment that we need to build is a paradigm shift away from civil society partnering with tech companies at the invitation of tech companies on problems and solutions defined and identified by tech companies under contracts written by tech companies, right? And for that, I think civil society will have to um, organize itself much better. Uh, it will, and you know, not to uh, advocate for a 
sort of paternalistic position on this at all, but it will have to, for, for the short term, lean on the global, uh, on its global counterparts, on this community, uh, create evidence, create, uh, you know, I'm hoping that so many of these uh, solutions that we're building here can do pilots uh, based on, uh, you know, cases in India and the rest of South Asia. And that's sort of how uh, civil society can reclaim some of its voice. It can build coalitions. It can build transnational and multi-stakeholder coalitions where tech companies can then be invited to be participants. You know, and where they're not just socializing their position and teaching us about community standards so that we can get to a better version of community standards, but we're also, they're also, we're also able to teach them. You know, Braver Angels is, a, is able to teach tech companies how to engage even-handedly with a politically diverse set of stakeholders. Right, and how to then make that representation to governments who don't necessarily care for that. Uh, and that, I think, that space needs to be created right now, not in region, but unfortunately here in, in, in the north. But, uh, you know, I, I really am sort of exhorting this group to think much more about uh, banding together with their counterparts in, in, in these regions uh, going forward. I think I'm just going to ask uh, Kieran as well to take a few reflection points to that. We ha only have five more minutes left, but drawing on lessons learned from Braver Angels, what do you think needs to happen as we think of restoring the partnership with tech companies? Sure. So I want to launch off on your point about optimism, because I think when it comes to changing norms, you kind of have to start small. You start with small platoons. We're all, we're all a small platoon here. Uh, that goes out there and tries to create virtuous cycles that build momentum in a decentralized way. And so that over time, you start to build influence on institutions. You can build critical mass. And suddenly, p people who might not be interested are like, oh, that's kind of cool. I want to be part of that community. Uh, but right now, obviously, we're the early adopters. There's self-selection bias, right? I mean, people who come to Braver Angels workshops tend to be people who are at least open to the idea of dialogue. Um, but we really encourage people to speak freely and fully. We don't want people to feel like they have to soften their positions or moderate, come to some kind of like mushy middle. We want people to feel like they can speak wholesomely and fully as long as they kind of buy into the ground rules that we have. And so I think sometimes if you just think of like, well, how could we change the whole tech landscape, the forces there are so strong. I mean, the economic incentives, the attention economy is always going to privilege engagement. What are the kinds of content that drive engagement? Negative, divisive content. The personal incentives, if I want to build an audience which is going to generate opportunities for my branding, for financial gain, what's the kind of content I'm going to put out there in the world? And also the emotional incentives, right? It's like, when I get a like or I get a retweet, there's like that dopamine rush. And I'm not really engaging with another perspective. I'm just sort of performing for my own side so I can get validation from them. Um, and so I think if we start with our own communities and we start to think in terms of a broader social movement that's not just focused on tech, not just focused on the bridging space, but is focused on all sorts of sectors and institutions in American life where you can find an interest in social cohesion, right? So companies, right, their mission is to make money, but they also have an interest in depolarization because polarization is harming their bottom line. It's harming employee retention. It's causing problems in the corporate boardroom. Or you think about the faith community, right? Their mission is to worship God, but polarization is causing problems for them and their congregations and their flock. So how do you bring those organizations to kind of take the work but do it in their own patch of the vineyard, right? And so then you're starting to build a broader coalition. And then again, it starts to be something that people are paying attention to. And the startups that are experimenting with new digital architectures can start to get some takeoff and then over time actually challenge the old models that are so entrenched and so divisive. I think that deserves a little bit of uh, a round of applause <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think a lot of the points that were raised are reflections. And reflections 
you know, usually call for conversation to continue. So my hope is that this conversation is going to continue. And as we're really thinking of the council as a place where we all are meeting to design tech that is actually advancing social cohesion, I think we are all coming with different entry points and different contributions that will actually make that happen. But again, back to the point that uh, uh, Jean raised earlier, let's try to also think of what are the positives? What are the tech companies trying to do? in the direction of actually strengthening relationships with civil society organizations rather than just looking at what is actually wrong. And I think that's really what I would like to encourage us to do, but I also want to have you talk to each other maybe for five more minutes as we wrap up this conversation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.